Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for being in this session. We will discuss today about or towards the city of the future. So thank you for this, uh, for your time. Uh, we hope you really enjoy a quality discussion with a high level panelist that I will introduce immediately. Uh, this is a chance, this is an opportunity to continue with a permanent debate about smart cities. And we would like this time tackle somehow different angles from the technology point of view, but also uh, from the more human-centric human approach. So thanks our panelists. Uh, we have today right here with us uh, Bertrand Maé. Uh, Bertrand, it is the deputy mayor, the deputy mayor of the city of Lyon. Uh, hi Bertrand, nice to meet you. Hello, Scott. We have also Michael Donaldson uh, from Barcelona. Michael is the commissioner of digital and innovation. So hi Michael, Michael very welcome. Good afternoon, thanks Oscar. And we have Pete Hollimon, which uh, is not from a city. Uh, Pete is from an MNO from O2 in UK and uh, Pete is the small cell delivery lead in the region of London. So hi Pete, how are you? Hi, thank you Oscar. Okay, so uh, before coming directly to the questions and to open the debate, I just wanted to make a quick introduction about this, let's say, a smart city concept. So let's let's go through, uh, and I will ask uh, the people on the technical side to show the first slide. Let's let's have a kind of an introduction to understand that context. We came from the analogic cities, and the analogic cities. It is a complex structure, a complex ecosystem, which it were mainly there are different circulations of different elements. From, where, from one side, the energy, the water, goods, people, information. Right now it's digital, but some years ago it was mostly analogic, so based on, on documentation and so on. And trash, don't forget about the trash circulations in the city. Digital has deeply impact on these circulations. And this is the question we want to launch to our panelists. What's been the impact of this digital and what's going to be next? If we just take a look on the next picture, on the next slide, and we consider how a city was conceived over the last century, that was a kind of the perfect overlying of different um, structural layers, a kind of, uh, let's say, the mechanical physiology of the city, the public transport, especially the underground, all the streets, all the rounds, the rings around, all the pipelines for the water, for the energy. That was the picture we had or more, uh, or more, let's say, this mechanical physiology and something changed dramatically where the digital came in. So if we go, if we move next, you will see that today's cities are somehow neural networks. Real-time decision-making, getting information, any of those circulations that I mentioned, and of course, people living there. So it's a citizen-centric approach. And on top of that, even if we consider how to benefit from digital, and if we move forward on the next slide, please, you will see here with a kind of collage of different pictures, how many technology has to be deployed in the urban context. So just having a look at these pictures, you can see small cells, you can see parking sensors, you can see mission critical connections, for instance, in the background, uh, sorry, in the in the underground, in the tunnels, you can see small data centers where to process most of this information, antennas. Uh, so that's that's a very very relevant deployment, and of course, how to make it, and this is the enabling part of whatever we will listen from the cities. So that would be my introduction. I hope we we set the frame of the discussion, and as you can imagine, and this is a debate about cities, uh, with the permission of uh, Pete, we will start with the cities. And I will start first asking Bertrand and also Michael about what are the principles of your strategy, the one in Lyon, the other in Barcelona, and what would be your positioning pitch? 
So Bertrand, if you can just position what is Leon's strategy and then we will go through Michael. Yes, thanks very much Oscar for uh, first of all for having invited me and giving me the opportunity to talk about our vision in Lyon. Uh, to introduce, I wanted to insist on maybe two points. Uh, first of all, as far as digital is concerned, um, we want Lyon to be um, an environmentally responsible and sustainable city. Uh, actually, we, we very recently declared the state of climate emergency as uh, Antonio Guterres, uh, Secretary General of the United Nations, urged the world policymakers to do. So this means that we want all our political choices to be oriented towards that goal or to be compatible with that goal of making greenhouse gas emissions decrease. Uh, as a consequence, we want to be very careful that the, um, let's say, the smart layer uh, we would deploy uh, is part of the solution and not part of the problem. Uh, so I think I will come back to this point later in this webinar, but for us, this is uh, this sustainability uh, necessarily implies digital sobriety. Okay. And second point, uh, we, we want to go towards a, a more inclusive city. Uh, of course, the pandemic showed uh, how digital could be a uh, help during this particular time, uh, how it could uh, ease meetings, work, etc. But it also showed how fragile some people were. And um, I'm now thinking about uh, pupils in our school, for instance, um, who were really in difficulty either because they didn't have the connection at home or the, the devices or uh, most of all the knowledge. Uh, it's one thing to be able to navigate on social media or to play on Fortnite, but it's an, a, an, another thing to be able to write an email, to use an uh, educational digital working environment, uh, to stay on, on, this part, on this particular uh, example. So, um, and we realized that parents could not help. So uh, we literally lost some of our pupils. So, um, um, I consider uh, our city of Lyon fully connected, at least uh, with 4G at that time, but this doesn't mean everybody is connected. Uh, so, this is a very important point when digitizing, for example, public services, more connectivity does not necessarily more uh, inclusivity. Okay, thank you, Betan. Uh, very clear, Lyon positioning. So, please, Michael, go ahead with the, this, uh, the Barcelona strategy. Yeah, thanks again, Oscar, and thanks a lot, uh, Thelnex, for inviting the City Hall of Barcelona. C'est un plaisir de partager cette rencontre avec le Marie Adjun de Lyon. Um, and to answer to your question, uh, Oscar and my colleague Pete in London as well, of course, and trying to answer to summarize uh, our key strategies uh, when it comes down to digital innovation, I'd say that we are focused mainly on, on three points. First of them all, when it comes to digital innovation, we are talking about uh, what we we say a humanizing technology, which, which is basically a human-centered uh, point of view regarding to technology and digital innovation. And it basically means that uh, technology and digital innovation has to be at the service of people's need. How can uh, digital innovation as, as such a, an important driver in our lives, especially after the lockdown, uh, where we have digitalized ourselves uh, in, in such a short period of time, um, how, how this uh, driver helps us to, to make better cities, more sustainable cities, more efficient cities, more 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 equitable uh, cities. That would be the, the first one. Second one, as Bertrand was just pointing out, uh, it's kind of the, the other side of the coin of the digital innovation and all the potential that co connectivity gives us it, where it comes uh, uh, down to digital divide. Uh, that would be the, our uh, se second priority, fighting against the digital divide, uh, working for a digital inclusion as a public policy. As the deputy mayor was pointing, uh, 
it's not only about connectivity or not only the access to devices, but it's also about the skills, all how, how to use uh, the, the whole potential that internet and the rest of the IT uh, technologies g gives us. So we've got a lot to, to work on that, and that's why it's uh, 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 um, one of our strategies and one we are uh, investing and putting a lot of our resources. And last, of course not least, uh, the use of the emerging technologies, maybe not such a emerging technologies, such, a, uh, such as big data, uh, AI, Internet of Things. We want to use these technologies in order to provide better public services, but at the same time, we want to introduce an ethic dimension on how we manage, how we handle these, these uh, technologies, because being so new, uh, we've discovered that they also sometimes carry um, carry some intrusion in digital rights, such as privacy, or uh, discrimination in, in our rights, such as the discrimination caused by the, the, the VIs uh, on the algorithms, on the use of AI. So basically these three, three key points, uh, humanizing technology, fight against the digital divide, and the ethic use on emergency technologies. Okay, so very clear statements, so very clear strategy. Let, let's go later on with the more deeper questions, but let's move now to another side of the digital approach, which is the MNO, the, the companies making the network deployments, providing the physical connectivity. So Pete, uh, let me let me introduce in a way, maybe more because of our personal relationship, but probably you are the pioneer guy in Europe, which has deployed uh, the higher number of small cells in the region of London. So uh, you are clearly ahead of the rest. How would you, let's say, introduce yourself related to this background of a small cells in the context of London and the region of London and the other major cities in UK? Yeah, thank you, Oscar. And again, thank you for the opportunity uh, to participate uh, in this session. Um, I think for us in London, so, um, we have, you say, pioneered. Uh, very flattering, and, and thank you. It's it's a team effort as always. So, prior to 2007, uh, we had trialled small cells as a solution, um, as the ever-evolving challenge of improving customer benefits, um, network improvements. Um, small cells was one of the trials that we undertook prior to 2017. And since 2017, um, we've really developed that and, and moved forwards over 1,100 sites, uh, small cells in London now. Uh, majority of those have been delivered uh, with, with Cellnex, which has been fantastic. Um, what, you know, we, we've, we've really developed that and I think we're at the point now and kind of a, a changing point where London is, London is the centre um, of the volumes we've delivered to date which you'd expect is a big and large city. Um, and we're now looking at realizing those benefits, those customer benefits to the network, uh, customer experience improvements outside of London as well, moving into our other key cities and key areas uh, in the UK. OK, thank you, Pete. We will go later about making these deployments in the city context, which probably is not so easy. So let, let, let's go back uh, to Bertrand and uh, as per your positioning, uh, would you mind to develop a little more what are the issues that you would tackle with the digital, how to take the connectivity decisions about the right technologies, the right solutions, and somehow uh, how to balance that within this green approach that you mentioned, Bertan? Yes, uh, so just let me just uh, say a few words about um, the facts, uh, about um, the impacts of the digital and the environment. Um, today, production and use of terminals uh, such as uh, screens, computers, uh, smartphones, uh, so terminals, data centers, uh, telecommunication networks and IoT connection modules represent uh, around 3.5% of greenhouse gas emissions in the world. And um, so this is more than uh, air transport. And uh, above all, the problem is that these emissions increase by around 5% a year. So which is a, a radically unsustainable trajectory. Not to talk uh, about uh, the fact that the materials are hardly recycled. 
uh, devices in, in big proportions finish in like uh, gigantic, gigantic dumps, uh, for example, in Ghana. Uh, and the materials are extracted in, uh, sometimes in disastrous environmental conditions. Uh, think about uh, rare earth in China or Africa, for example. And moreover, the problem is that devices have very short lifetimes. So we believe in Lyon that we can uh, no longer rely only on supposed positive externalities of the digital. Uh, we really have to measure the environmental impact of uh, uh, IoT, smartphone, uh, uh, smart objects, networks themselves. Uh, and we must be also very demanding on the recyclability of the devices. Uh, so the, the environmental gains we can hope from technology do not necessarily exceed uh, bad environmental impacts uh, of the technology in itself. And so we need an objective point of view uh, on it before deploying the technology. And uh, unfortunately, today it's really not the case. So let me maybe give you two examples of uh, what we believe in, what we don't. Um, for, for example, we believe in smart urban lighting, and uh, we're going to, to install, install it uh, massively. Uh, so when I talk about smart urban lighting, I mean uh, lighting that adapts its power to the, the presence or not of a car, of a, a pedestrian pa passing by. If nobody is passing by, uh, then lighting power is quite weak, and then it's more powerful when, uh, when somebody is here. Uh, so why do we believe in it? Because it represents little or nearly no data to manage. And uh, it, uh, co compared to classic lumps, uh, smart lumps allow a significant reduction of energy consumption. Uh, even if you consider all the production process of the smart layer, the sensors, etc. Mm -hmm. So th this is something we will uh, deploy uh, in the city. And we hope for this particular case, uh, savings around 50% uh, of uh, energy consumption. On the other hand, um, on the other hand, uh, another point we we don't really believe in are uh, self-driving cars. I give this example because in Lyon a few years ago there was some uh, experiments uh, of uh, of self-driving vehicles, uh, and the, the the city and the metropole used to support it, but it's no longer the case. Uh, why? Because it, it implies a huge amount of data. Uh, I heard things like uh, terabytes an hour per vehicle, uh, for example, uh, which means huge electricity consumption. Uh, it could also imply what we call rebound effect. Uh, rebound effect is the fact that energy savings you, you got by improving the, the traffic uh, are lost but by the fact that maybe uh, more cars will be sold or uh, they will be more used because of uh, the, the improvement of user experience in your car. Uh, well, it also causes many technical problems, uh, such as um, uh, how do you make classic cars live together uh, with self-driving cars? Uh, the fact that it works only if you have a, a consistent connectivity system on, on your whole territory. Uh, you, 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 can, you just can't lose connection in, in that example. Um, and plus the infrastructure, the roads, the streets might uh, need to be really redesigned. Uh, this is a, an example of technology which can literally uh, imply to, to configure the public space again. Um, and maybe let me tell you about a, a last point, which is uh, uh, 5G, uh, because the, the deployment recently started in France. Our city council called the government for moratorium on the deployment. And why? Because we are in Lyon pretty sure that, uh, at least the contrary is not proven, that uh, with the deployment will come a massive increase of energy consumption and waste production linked to the, the, the massive increase of data, uh, which is of course uh, wished by uh, access providers, of course, and uh, linked with the, the massive increase of uh, IoT. So that's it about about uh, green. Just a few examples to to explain our position. But no, I, I find it quite interesting, Bertrand, because you mentioned the autonomous car, and you are right. Somehow, and I'm not an expert at all, but conceptually, everything you can make to increase the efficiency on the car uh, mobility 
as this provokes additional remaining capacity, this this is again oversaturated because people, it's, as, as this is efficient right now, I take even more the cars, this rebound effect that you mentioned. But it's interesting because uh, uh, how to introduce these elements in the city context, and you mentioned about designing from scratch again, mm -hmm. the street and the, the use of the public space, I think that's going to be a discussion for the next years, clearly. So thank you. Thank you, Bertrand. Uh, very interesting. So let's go, Michael, uh, on the on the Barcelona side. Also, Barcelona, probably for many reasons, for the, the investment of the private companies, because it's the 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 mobile world capital. It's also one a smart city reference worldwide with the smart city expo and so on. It seems that connectivity levels are really good. Although, of course, this digital divide for specific groups of, of our uh, social structure it is something that we need to fight against. But assuming that this connectivity is good one, really good one, what about the possib possibilities of this new generation of technologies like the 5G and what are the new kind of ideas uh, on your, let's say, strategic framework, on your, on your mid-long-term uh, mid plans as a city? Yeah, yeah. When it comes to to connectivity, as 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 you point, Barcelona is in a quite very good uh, conditions. I would say, I don't want to compare myself to to other, any other cities. We we need to focus on on our situation, but we can be happy. Uh, you're right. Uh, we've got uh, these two big events: Mobile World Congress and the, and the Smart City Congress. Uh, we've been collaborating in a in a dynamic of public uh, private uh, collaboration that has brought a lot a lot of uh, good success uh, to the development of of our city and in fact we carried on last uh, october um with the effect with the impact of the of the COVID, and especially with the lockdown we carry on uh, a massive uh, survey in order to to know the situation of connectivity in 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 the city and and the use of the of the internet the good use of internet uh figures are really good in that sense 94 percent of the population is connected um, from that 100 percent 85 is connected to fiber which gives us a, a good quality because it's not about it's not only about uh, being uh, connected but having a good uh, connection good quality of connection that allows you to to, to deploy all the the potential uh, that that connectivity gives you on the other side and as we were pointing uh, the first uh, part of the intervention uh, we've got it arises the, the digital divide and especially it's more important with the contrast um after the impact of the of the lockdown and this hybrid digital analogic times we're living the good news or relative good news because uh, when it comes to individuals and people who are suffering this digital divide we cannot talk about uh, good news but the, the, the thing is that only one percent of the population in barcelona that's more or less like 10,000 out of a million, more than a million and a half population that lives in Barcelona. Um, this 1% cannot uh, access to internet uh, because due to economic uh, issues, economic problems. Uh, so that is something that we are focused on and that's something on, that we are keen to, to, to work, that we are going to care to to work. It's not only about connectivity, but Tran was saying, was pointing it out at the, at the beginning. It's also about the capacity and the, 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 the skills skills uh, you have in order to use it. Uh, but it's true that without connectivity, you have got nothing at all, uh, at least in the digital world. So yeah, it's very important uh, not only to guarantee to, to, to have this right to access to, to internet and the, 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 the better quality much, uh, much better. It's also about progress. And it's also about uh, studying and deploying new new technology. And when it comes to connectivity and when it comes to new technology, we're talking about 5G. 5G, we all know what what the characteristics and what's the the the, the good thing that uh, that that means this jump uh, from 4G to to, to 5G. Um, the the lack of latency, the the, the the quality, the speed, the amount of connections at the, at the same time and this is going to allow us to 
um, to try to, to, to develop a lot of innovation uh, in the sense of humanizing technology we were saying uh, before. Uh, we are closing, we are working close uh, with the mobile, they've got the 5G initiative and with them we're going to launch now um, on, a, on the Calalier, which is a public equipment that centralizes the innovation, urban innovation in, in Barcelona, in the district of the uh, 22A, 22 uh, Arroba. We're going to deploy a 5G lab, which is going to allow us uh, to test on real, uh, on real time and on real uh, public space. Uh, we're talking about the, the autonomous car uh, before. We'll be able to test this technology uh, regarding to different in projects, to different innovation projects uh, that we are going to come from the public initiatives, but also from 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 private initiatives. So we're going to have a lab, which is basically a space in the city, uh, and it's going to allow us to keep on with this dynamic of collaboration between public and private sector. Uh, always, always trying to focus on on the good common um, values and on a good common interest uh, that everybody that lives in in the city in Barcelona are looking for and are trying are trying and and, and they are really working. On, on this. So, Michael, we, we would like to be invited with the conclusions on the connected car. So maybe you can convince Bertrand and Leon that uh, they can change uh, their ideas. No, just just joking. Absolutely. So, but thank thank you both. I think it's 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 clear and interesting. And now, and I I go back to Pete. Uh, Pete, uh, normally the MNO, let's say, was used to make uh, the the network deployment in a in a what was what we call normally the macros on top of the hills in some rooftops but now things are changing you are a very relevant actor on the skin of the city so you are in the middle of the crowd making these deployments and so on uh, what can you explain us about working in this so dense city context yeah i mean it's a it's a very dynamic in environment to be honest with you um ever changing um what we've you know a, a small cell to us and it can vary but the small cell to us is a is a capacity solution the the purpose of, of the small cell is to offload the traffic from the surrounding macro uh, macro cell which then yields greater customer benefits and customer experience through doing that. So by bringing this small cell or the, the equipment closer to the, the um, end user, it improves that customer experience. So it is a dynamic and challenging environment. Um, lighting columns is a typical deployment that we've used to date. Um, we need to be sympathetic to local authorities in terms of making sure that the aesthetics um, of those lighting columns, those structures, those assets. What we would like to deploy is in keeping, is discrete. Uh, our equipment vendor is Nokia. Uh, we believe we've got a product that we rolled out on those you know, 1100 plus sites that is um, suits that criteria. Um, you know, it gives the customer benefit, it gives the network benefit, it gives the connectivity benefit whilst being sympathetic to the structure it's it's installed to. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think it's it's being mindful of the environment we're deploying in um, and mindful of the requirements and the needs of the local authority um, that we you know that our suppliers are working into. Uh, Pete, uh, you mentioned uh, a concept that I think it's really interesting and maybe it could be helpful to the rest of the audience to go through. This idea of capacity solution. So may may you explain a bit more, not technically, so the audience can get that concept, which is really interesting. What does it mean in a crowded place? Yeah. So the you know essentially uh, a macro cell is there to provide coverage uh, for a surrounding area for a particular area um, that has a limited amount of capacity. Um, a busy central place, city centres, what have you have a limitation on the capacity of the surrounding macro cell. So by having the small cell closer to the end user, um, what we find is that customer experience throughout uh, the duration of the user in that environment improves. 
Um, so yeah, it's it, it is key, has been key. We've seen, you know, when we trialled this some years ago, these are the improvements we've seen, and these are the the benefits to our customers and our on our network um, that we've we've had over the years, and continue, you know, want to continue to develop. So very very, very interesting. And let me so from from your pitch, a question maybe directly to Bertrand and and, and Michael. So. Normally speaking, and, and it's very uh, rational, I mean, there is uh, some strong considerations from the cities about the visual impact of collocating such a technological elements, hanging from a lamppost or in a bus shelter or on a facade, whatever. Uh, may this be impacting these potential restrictions or different policies by city, maybe this impacting the, the level of deployment of these solutions, which are key to manage the capacity, the demand of the digital experience that everybody is doing, in, especially in the downtown. I don't know, maybe uh, Michael and, and secondly, Bertrand, if you don't mind. Yeah, I don't know. To, to, to be honest, I don't, I wouldn't be able to answer you very accurate on, on this question, but not really. I'd say that not really. I mean, we haven't, find many opposition in in that sense i mean i don't know i, I guess barcelona is very used to to have a, a lot of um new items coming on on on, on the city i mean I, i'm thinking about the the bising uh, which is uh, was one of the first cities with uh, sharing sharing bicycles and that was a, a big piece of uh, furniture if we can say it uh, that way, in, in the middle of the street. I'm thinking about now the, the tactic urbanism in order to widen up our roads, in order to let people walk. So, I don't know, I'd say that uh, people are more or less used to, to see new things going on. And, and, and I, I would even say that people are demanding that things happen in the, in the city. In that sense, okay. uh, Barcelona not being the capital of of Spain, uh, we we haven't got all the power of the of the big state of the big state departments and, and the big uh, financial capitals. But we've got a lot of creativity, we've got a lot of innovation, we've got a lot of things going on, and and and, it, and it's good that the people can see it. Of course, you're gonna always find a lot of uh, or, or some opposition, which is also good. We are in a diversity uh, society, so we need to to gather all together and and combine all kind of interests and and of course there's a lot of ignorance on on the on the on the on the, on the good things that bring uh, along the, the the technology and it's our task to do some pedagogy as well and to explain um what are the, the benefits and what are also the negative externalities uh leon was was talking about their bid to to fight against the externalities own that have the environment impact and it's true i mean we we cannot be naive uh, we cannot be uh saying that everything is 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 great but uh on the other side, we cannot stop. We cannot go back to 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 the past. Uh, so I don't know. I mean, it's all about explaining. It's all about accountability as well. And it's it's an important task we have to do. But it's also about not stopping. Okay. So, so uh, like listening this music from the city that is open to understand the advantage and of course to manage the difficulties too. So thanks, thanks, Michael, Bertrand. Any any additional let's say, point element on, on Michael's position? Yeah, uh, I pretty agree. Um, the visual impact is quite uh, important and uh, uh, as soon as possible, we try to to hide the antennas, for example, in, uh, in false chimneys or, um, and, and, and it's important to, to preserve the beauty of the city. Uh, uh, we are also a touristic city, so uh, people, when they come to visit the city, they don't want to see uh, antennas everywhere um uh, the the um, coming back to to green uh, aspects etc uh problem with hiding is that uh, people think there it, it collaborates to the um, uh, dematerial uh, dematerialization uh, imaginary you know so uh, it participates to make people think that uh it is like uh, not existing Transparent. Physically, yeah. transparent. 
that's it. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So, so thanks. Let's go. Let's go because before uh, going through questions because it seems there are quite a lot. But let's go to a let's say a final uh, positioning from each of you. Uh, I'll go through question each of you, and and maybe then we can open a more uh, uh, a more questions oriented. Uh, session later or um, last part of the session. So to Bertrand, uh, listening to you, my question would be, uh, what's next? Is this movement going to be equalizing all the cities? So at some point over the future, every city will have the same model or on the other side, what would be the cities leading? Uh, how much this will be this ranking, positively speaking of cities and what's the next station of this journey? Well, I, I think today the question is, um, do we want, do we as citizens want to go further towards uh, so-called smart city? Um, we, we think it's actually really a, a political choice uh, that needs to be discussed and debated. Uh, technology is uh, neither good or bad or, uh, or neutral. Um, so, some examples of the questions that can be asked, uh, do, do we want more cameras in our streets, uh, either for surveillance by the police or um, other purposes like, um, I don't know, uh, pedestrian traffic management or um, the, this, uh, this questions um, problem, uh, the, the, the problem of uh, general surveillance. Uh, like, uh, you know, f face recognition and the possible drifts uh, linked to this uh, or profit being made with pictures of you without you knowing it. Uh, so uh, points uh, Michael talked before, like uh, privacy issues, uh, who, who does the data belong to? Do we want uh, drones in those skies instead of birds? Uh, technically, there is no problem, but does, uh, the, the, the fact that we can deploy this technically does not mean that we, we want it. Uh, do we want public spaces to be privatized? Uh, from what I can see now, uh, there are mostly private operators that push for smart small solutions. And on this point, the, um, the, the sidewalk project that was abandoned last year in Toronto is quite uh, interesting. Um, also, uh, we, we talked about uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, these are also questions. Uh, we, with that, uh, I'm now referring to you know click workers, whose job, if we can call it a job, is to train artificial intelligence, answering thousands of uh, kind of yes/no questions. For example, uh, very ill-paid, uh, uh, with no kind of uh, labor code or social protection. So, what is next? As for me, it's uh, information and, and debate. Uh, first, okay. uh, de define a, a society project, then install the technology we need, we want, and which is compatible with sustainability, and not the other way around, namely deploy the infrastructure and then think about all the, the, posi the, the, the possible uses. And um, actually, there, there are currently such initiatives in, in several cities in France, uh, following the beginning of 5G deployment, uh, not yet in Lyon, but uh, we are thinking about uh, doing something like this, uh, which consists in kind of uh, citizens' assemblies where technical experts, uh, sociologists, uh, access providers come and talk with citizens about technological issues. And at the end, those citizens write recommend recommendation that can inspire policymakers. So this is quite new, but uh, I do hope that um, in the future this could really be generalized uh, because uh, I really believe it, it can help to define a, a societal project. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Bertrand. And thank you for introducing the artificial intelligence concept because I think this is a direct question to Michael. And the reason is that uh, last week, Barcelona City Council presented uh, artificial intelligence strategy, which is, let's say, not normal from a city perspective. So, uh, Michael, that would be one question and maybe a second one uh, also, which is, and what Burton said about this citizenship participation to, to get a, a 360 view 
and to take a collective decision, which is also that uh, uh, also the Barcelona City Council has tried also to push quite a lot with the different stakeholders. Yeah, yeah, ab ab absolutely. Uh, and, and when it comes to this kind of uh, technology, which is, I mean, AI is not new. Uh, it's been here for 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 around for some years, but it's it, it is pretty new. The impact that's having in in our lives, the use of algorithms. We all know the way the the network, social uh, network works, or how uh, Netflix every Friday night sends us an email telling us which is the next movie or TV show we'd like to to see because uh, an algorithm tells him um, tells us. Uh, uh, the, based on the data they've been gathering what's our next uh, TV show that we're keen to to watch so uh we need to to work a lot with the uh, with citizens in that sense uh we need to do uh to push forward a lot of transparency um in order to explain uh, why we are providing public services uh with this technology um as, as, as you said, we're launching this strategy based on two goals. First of all, would be like uh, how to become or how to pass from a reactive administration to a proactive uh, administration, uh, combine data, no data, good data, I would say. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and this is a big issue because we need to, to gain the trust uh, of, of our citizens in order to collect the, the data. As I said, it's very funny the way uh, we as citizens give our all our data to Google and, and to Facebook and Twitter and, and so on. But when it comes to, to the city hall or the state or, or some public, uh, we are very reluctant on, on, on sharing our data. Uh, and basically we're going to use from the public institutions, we're going to use this data in order to provide better public services and in order to guarantee our our rights. So uh, there's a gap there, and we need to fill it with with trust and uh, letting our citizens know that we are not going to use uh, that data in order to to invade their privacy, but rather in order to to provide better public services. In that sense, uh, becoming uh, from an ad reactive administration to a proactive administration. I mean. There are figures that show us there are some studies on, on, at the European level that show us that almost 30% of the people who would be benefit of social economic grants uh, do not apply for them because they don't know that they exist. So imagine if we had the data that that different um, people uh, according to the profiles because they had asked for a subside before because we are not there they are on on, on dole or whatever instead of launching and uh, waiting for people to come and ask uh, we would be able with the combined data and algorithm uh, give them the information so it wouldn't be lost and then uh, coming to the second issue and related to what Bertrand was was saying the the, the very important participation of the of the people in that sense, in this strategy, we are going to, uh, like New York or Helsinki or Amsterdam have already done, we're going to create a register uh, registration for the algorithms. We're going to make them be auditable so anyone can can come and the all different of course protection copyrights and and so on they will be able to, to know what's going on and especially when this affects to to, to rights and and to discrimination and then we are going to work for a kind of uh, an an assistancement agreement agreement uh, all during the city with experts, citizens, companies, and uh, universities, uh, investigation research centers. We're going to make kind of an, a big agreement on how we treat uh, the emerging the emerging technologies uh, in the sense of humanizing technology that, that I was pointing at the, at the beginning. Okay, so very very clear. And now, uh, Pete, uh, my last question before coming into the questions from the audience. Uh, everything you have explained us, it's been about the the old technology, I mean the 4G. So all these deployments you mentioned are 4G based small cells. So how will be the 5G and the key benefits? So how this will explode somehow in terms of deployment and uh, additional value to the citizenship and to those uh, hotspot capacity that you mentioned? Yeah, um, I think um, 
it's you know it's important to note that whilst 5G is an important technology that we're bringing on board as all MNOs are across the world, um, there is still a large share of any given network that is you know the handsets, the devices for 5G is still I wouldn't say in the infancy, but are up and coming. They are developing. The, the volumes aren't there yet. So whilst we're driving delivery of new 5G sites day on day out into our network, and small cells will be part of that in in the future, 4G is the kind of enabler for for 5G future small cells is is a key aspect, and I think that's the bit that we're working on in terms of you know we we are deploying 4g small cells as our current baseline for our network once we and further we work through our, our 5g small cell rollout strategy that will evolve um, the requirements of all the things we've just talked about in terms of the internet of things you know uh, all all these technological advances require densification of of 5g um, now, whether that's through a small cell or other means, these are the these these are going to be the needs that need to be delivered to realise those ambitions, those dreams. So, 5G from a, a small cell perspective, yes, could well be greater densification um, of the units deployed on a on a street level, whilst being very mindful, as we've said before, of the aesthetics, um, not wanting to um, you know detract from the tourists, the, the street landscapers itself, but whilst delivering that, you know, that balancing act and delivering um, the customer benefits to our users uh, and, and benefits into our network. So yeah, 4G, you know, 4G small cells is an enabler for 5G small cells, um, which, you know, will come in time. Thanks, Pete. And if I may, I, I know that I'm the moderator, but uh, I like very much Pete Pitch now on these uh, closing statements, but somehow the telco industry with these new technology waves, which are still uncertain, are providing the foundations of the future. So maybe it's not clear yet what new business models value to the citizens will be uh, possible because of this deployment. So there is always a balance and right now, not still clear or picture because the technology has gone much faster probably than the solutions and and and, and the acceptation as a society that we have. But uh, thanks, thanks Pete for that. Uh, I think it's been interesting and I would suggest because uh, uh, they are commenting me that there are many questions on, on the chat. So I will go through some of them. Uh, there is one which is quite, uh, a top down from the smart approach, which is, uh, hi guys, what are the key players in the smart city ecosystem? Who has a role to play in this complex ecosystem? I would suggest, because I would like to go through as many questions as possible, uh, maybe a very short and direct, uh, uh, straightforward statements, answers, and maybe everything that can be complementary, please add. If somehow is redundant, uh, we would proceed for the next one. So may I start with who who would be the first one? Key players in the smart oh, city. Ha happy to go yes. first. So I okay, think, Pete, that's I, yours. I think the key word is collaboration um, and engagement. You know, we all we all play a part of this. Um, <laughs> there are benefits to greater connectivity, um, but we need to be mindful. Um, uh, you know, of of certain aspects and not you know excluding others, um, as, which has been talked about earlier on. So, it's the key key engagement of the key stakeholders, both from the local authority, the various stakeholders within the local authority and their supply chain, in conjunction with ourselves and our supply chain, um, making sure that those those requirements are met um, and we're clear on you know, the requirements that we need, I guess, from an operator's perspective, whilst being sympathetic to the needs of the local authority and, and their stakeholders. Okay, good good point to that. Uh, Bertrand, Michael, something to add to that? Yes, maybe just one point, but uh, I already said it before. Uh, key players, uh, everybody is a key player. So there, there are uh, the authorities, uh, the private sector, and what I said before, uh, I believe citizens, the citizens. themselves. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
So these three, uh, clearly, these three entities, which are uh, a known opinion each of them. Uh, Michael, something else? Not, not much. I, I do agree with, with Peter Bertrand. I'd say everyone who is looking for the common good for the interest public is, is more happy than to, to, to join in that sense. We've launched in Barcelona our urban innovation platform and there's over 100 people uh, from different uh, perspectives that uh, help us to, to make better policies on innovation. So yeah, everybody uh, that has common interest uh, is more than welcome to 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 join and and look for the common good. Mike, you said better policies in innovation clearly. So what what needs to change in in your cities uh, to to enable to to increase these uh, benefits for all shareholders? What are the old things that we would need to restructure, change, to make this um, deployment quicker, more efficient, more open? Because we are working on mechanism which most of them are from the last century. Let me tell in that yeah, way. Yeah. 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 Well, it's it's a pure, it's a very very interesting question and it's very complex to answer it in in just a, a short intervention. As as you said, uh, we are still under the structures of the of the last century and there is such a huge uh, innovation on, on all kind of of fields. Uh, we know now, Harari was telling us how in the last 20 years there have been as many uh, of technological innovation uh, as the, the whole history of humanity and we are still trying to to, to, to cope uh, and to understand what that, that means. So as we won't be able to, to understand uh, the, all the, 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 the technologies because there are so many and they are so complex, I'd say that what we have to look for is to, to, to try to share uh, some values that identify us all together. And then everyone from their own perspective uh, will, will be able to, to, to join, to provide, to, uh, and to deliver, and to add a good uh, quality um, public value. So I'd say Pete was pointing out uh, collaboration. This one is key. Diversity, bringing in diversity, different points of view, different perspective. Trust is very important to, to be trust. And I would say generosity as well, because we all tend to think that we are the ones who are right, the ones who know everything. And, and yeah, we love to make some tweets and tell, yeah, we're doing a lot of collaboration. But when it comes at the end of the day, it's about generosity and about uh, sharing our power because everybody's got power. Uh, so, yeah, I'd say it would be uh, key to find these common values that can uh, bring us together in, in order to to, 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 to to the same goals. Okay, I, I like I like Michael this mindset of generosity of listening and n not being uh, so let's say so close that you are the only one having having the right uh, opinion or view. So uh, like it, uh, Bertrand. Something else to add from the city: what changes enablers uh, old instruments to be updated that can make it uh, more speedy? Well, um, I don't really know what what. what what we would like to use technology for uh, in this uh, in the, the following years is um, use platforms that can be used by uh, uh, that, that can help us to to communicate uh, easy easily more easily with uh, citizens uh, for example to to collectively think about places we want to uh, to have uh, works on uh, projects in the city. We we believe that technology is a way uh, maybe to to catch more people, uh, people who are usually far from um, authorities and the, the decision. And we'll try to catch them with uh, digital platforms. But as I said before, we also know that people uh, anyway are are quite far from uh, digital and technology and it's a challenge to to catch them and, and bring them with us uh, using those kind of uh, of platforms okay another question to Pete as I introduced Pete as the pioneer guy uh, sorry for the for, sorry for the, the, the expression but uh, by deploying these small cells in the city of uh, London that you mentioned is uh, 1100 uh, what would be your forecast your estimation in terms of 
small cell numbers or connectivity solution numbers at, uh, in London in 20 years? What would be the regular volume in a city like London that you may consider because of IoT, uh, 7G or 8G at that time, uh, fixed wireless access, vehicle to infrastructure, autonomous car, all these elements. What, what do you guess could be the number of these deployments in 20 years in a city like London, as you have today 11, 1100? Yes, I mean, I think, you know, whilst we've delivered a lot in London, um, that's not by any means us saying that we've delivered enough in London or, you know, it's not that we will stop in London. Um, we, you know, you know, we, we recognise that there are continuing, you know, a network is a, a living, breathing thing, um, continually evolving. Technology, as you say, is continually evolving. The requirements of the technology continually evolving. So, there are many volumes and numbers and you know um numbers banded around um uh, you know I, i'm not going to commit to a number on here but it, it, you know it, you know you go as far as 20 years into the future that you know what's happened in the last 20 years technology wise and from an mno perspective huge amount of activity so are we going to see that activity you know the same fold again quite possibly i think again it's you know whatever the requirements of society the the operators then trying to support that in terms of delivering of that so if you know we all have um you know uh, wireless cars then you know there's there's going to be a network required to do support that as bertram i think has said so it, it's you know um yeah the the position is limitless potentially um but again going back to the previous point it needs to be within the constraints of um, you know what the people want, what the people need, uh, what the local authorities need and want, uh, and, and supportive of that as a as a you know engagement and a collaborative approach. So yeah, it's you know London, we've delivered a lot uh, in you know comparison maybe to other European cities, but you know we could you know we we want to and we'd like to carry on that deploy, deployment and rollout in London and into into wider cities in the UK. Thank you. Thank you. May I just get some extract as we are uh, three minutes left to a couple of minutes left to get uh, the closing time. So first, um, I will just cover concepts. I don't want to go through the same, uh, let's say, topics, but conceptually, I think we are a more human centric from the cities. Some years ago, we were more technology centric. I think right now we are more human centric. There is an ethics behind any of the technology when using uh, uh, these new uh, elements that can help us to have a much more quality of life and more efficient processes, whatever. But we need to make a detailed study about how to apply it. I would say, you know, that there is many technology which uh, doesn't know yet the problem this technology will address. So I think the technology is a kind of firework and we need to make this speaking and i think uh, the 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 point of view from the cities like barcelona leon and some others it's very clear i i like very much the the way pete approach with this idea that although sometimes the equipment is not i'm not saying well accepted but it's somehow confusing the equipment provides us a digital experience anywhere we are and this is thanks to the the investment, the deployment from MNOs like O2 in, in UK and many others. So in that sense, it's everything a kind of balance. And what I personally, and sorry to personalize messages, but one of the things I like most, it's the openness, the mindset open uh, from, from Michael, from Bertrand, from Pete, from Cellnex2 to have these debates and to take a decision and to move forward. And I expect that this is not only will be happening in London, Lyon and Barcelona, but everywhere else worldwide so thank you thank you for your time it's been a pleasure really appreciate your time also the audience i cannot see the audience the audience but i expect you enjoy the discussion and let's meet uh, on the next connectivity day by Celnix. thanks a lot and uh, have a, the, a good uh, rest of the day thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you.